evening and welcome. You're watching Primetime News on TV1, bringing you the news. I'm Tarush Kumar Singha. Well, travel restrictions will be reimposed from midnight tonight. We have the latest coming up in the bulletin, but up first in your headlines. Island-wide travel restrictions from midnight. President takes several decisions to minimize the economic impact. Impose a two-week lockdown to control the pandemic. A request by four medical bodies. SLPP says Port City Bill did not receive two-thirds majority due to miscalculation. Nisanka Senadipati and seven others acquitted from avant-garde case. Top story this evening. The President's media division has said that several decisions have been made to minimize the impact caused to the people and the economy due to the travel restrictions that will come into effect at midnight. Issuing a statement, the PMD noted that these decisions had been conveyed by the President to the ministers and relevant officials during a meeting of the Presidential Task Force for the Prevention of COVID-19. Meeting, the president had said that the delivery of essential goods a day before closing down the economic center should be permitted, while also allowing agricultural activities, the collection of garbage, and the development of roads and other construction activities during this period. The president had also instructed to vest public and private hospitals with the responsibility of treating COVID-19 patients who are detected based on PCR tests. A decision has also been made to utilize Ayurveda treatment facilities for the treatment of patients. Meanwhile, the president had said that he will not hesitate to make the right decision on behalf of the people upon consulting experts in the sector. This situation might extend further. Therefore, we must ensure that the activities that have an impact on livelihoods must continue to take place in the country. The people must be aware of the services that will be available. When there is a team, that team must be allowed to exercise its duties. The minister, state minister, epidemiologists, doctors and specialists must work together as a team in this regard. As I mentioned earlier, island-wide travel restrictions will come into effect from 11 p.m. today. This report focuses on the activities that will be carried out in the country until the 28th of May. How will travel restrictions be imposed in the country? Travel restrictions will be imposed at 11 p.m. today and will be lifted at 4 a.m. on the 25th of May. These restrictions will be imposed once again at 11 p.m. on the 25th of May before being lifted at 4 a.m. on the 28th of May. Who can leave their homes during this period? Essential services will be allowed to operate during this period. Employees of essential service sectors can use their service ID or a letter from the employer to travel to work. The media ID card or a letter certifying one's employment can be used to travel to work as well. Restrictions have not been imposed on engaging in farming as well. Therefore, they will be allowed to engage in farming, visiting relatives, prison inmates, engaging in religious pilgrimage, and going on excursions will not be allowed. Interprovincial restrictions will continue to be in effect as well. Therefore, the public must refrain from such activities. Delivery services of medicines and food items will be allowed to operate throughout this period. If an area is under isolation, the residents of that area must remain indoors. They cannot leave their homes until the isolation status is lifted. What essential services will operate during this period? Water, electricity, fuel, healthcare services, pharmaceuticals, the tri forces, police, airports and entities involved in export and import activities will be considered as essential services and will be allowed to operate during this period. Will stores be kept open when travel restrictions are in effect? Four hundred and twenty-one Satosa stores and the Satosa storage facilities in Vyangwada, Kurnagala, Valisara and Bosa will be kept open. However, retail trade will not be permitted when the restrictions are in effect. All economic centers in the country will be kept open. Bakeries will be kept open as well. Bakery 
How can food and other goods be purchased from stores? The divisional secretary will be allowed to purchase goods under the market rates and prepare food packs. Mobile vendors will be allowed to operate. Meat stalls, dry rations and other food items can be delivered to the customers through an online mechanism. Will transport services operate during this period? Passenger trains will not operate from midnight today until the 28th of May. State-run buses of the Sri Lanka Transport Board will also not be in operation. However, state-run buses transporting employees attached to essential service sectors will be in operation. Private buses will not function during the period of the restrictions. Will a two-week lockdown be imposed from the 28th of May? Army Commander General Shavendra Silva has refuted reports on social media stating that a two-week lockdown will be imposed in the country. According to the Army Commander, no such decision has been made so far. He made these remarks in reference to social media posts stating that a two-week island-wide lockdown will be imposed from the 1st of June. Meanwhile, our cameras captured the manner in which the public prepared themselves for the travel restrictions that will come into effect at midnight tonight. Is restricting travel enough at this point? The Sri Lanka Medical Association, the Government Medical Officers Association and the Association of Specialist Physicians convened a joint media briefing today. At the media briefing, all medical professionals unanimously agreed that an island-wide lockdown must be imposed for at least 14 days. The Sri Lanka Medical Association, the Government Medical Officers Association, the Government Medical Officers Association and the Association of Specialist Physicians would like to make a request. The best and the only option at this point is to stay indoors at least for 14 days. We cannot keep hope on the interprovincial travel restrictions that have been imposed. What happens is that when we have the uh, many shorter, we'll say that three days and then a break for one day and then another three days. Likewise, if you go on repeating for about five days, so altogether we may have gone for about another 20 days of lockdown. But because that we have breaks in between, we let that infection to, I mean, as you give the break, people come out and people go for work and then they gather together and then we induce spread of the infection again. At every disturbance, we uh, promote the uh, transmission of the infection. The effectivity uh, definitely would go down. So that's why we need to have a lockdown at a stretch without having uh, interruptions in between. Only a handful of people from the Institute of Infectious Diseases are participating in these affairs. They are by no means professionals in this field. The lockdown that was imposed in the past few days was useless because there was no scientific basis behind it. If that was done based on someone's advice, that advice was wrong. Whatever the restriction the government is going to impose starting from today till Tuesday must be extended further. Otherwise, this 5 
five day lockdown would be pointless. More beds can be manufactured and yes, that is a necessity. But we have to keep in mind that most of the rich countries in the world with all these facilities made shipping containers to keep these beds. The economy will have an impact through this. But if the country is not placed under a lockdown, the impact it will have on the economy will be much severe. <laughs> A group of essential people who were supposed to be vaccinated have been missed by the authorities. That is the reason for this massive stir in society at the moment. The Institute of Infectious Diseases has to undergo serious restructuring. What is the response of the health ministry to the 14-day lockdown? The decision we have taken at present is the best decision. We might take various decisions after analyzing the situation that will transpire in the future. We will decide whether we will take a step forward or take a step backwards. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's total tally of COVID-19 infections reached 157,677 today following the detection of 2,891 new cases. Official figures indicate that 38 deaths have been reported caused due to the virus in the country. Accordingly, the total death toll due to the virus stands at 1,089. On a more positive note, no COVID-19 deaths have been confirmed today. update this evening. The Met Department has forecasted heavy showers in the southwestern region of the country from tomorrow. This report focuses on the current weather situation in the country. The Department of Meteorology has forecasted rains up to 100 millimeters in the western and Sabragamo provinces along with the Gaul, Matra, Kandy, Nurelia and Putalam districts. According to the weather forecast, wind speeds may also increase in the country. The forecast adds that the wind speed can increase to between 40 and 50 km per hour at times in the western slopes of the central hills and the northern, north central and northwestern provinces and in the Hambantota district. Meanwhile, the Department of Meteorology has said that the low pressure area over the Bay of Bengal is likely to intensify gradually into a cyclonic storm. What is the impact this can have on the country? The turbulent weather is likely to transform into a low pressure area by tomorrow. Our predictions have indicated that this will develop into a high pressure area by the 23rd before transforming into a cyclone on the 24th. However, this situation only has an indirect impact on Sri Lanka. The direct impact is on India. Therefore, intermittent showers can be experienced in the country. We advise the fishing and naval communities to avoid going out to sea during this period. Showers can be experienced on the 24th, 25th, 26th in the southwestern region of the country due to this situation. If there are incessant rains, it may cause flash floods and earth slips in areas such as Gaul, Ratnapura and Kalupara. News from the courts this evening. Avant Garde Chairman Nisanka Senadipati and seven others were acquitted and released by permanent High Court trial at Bar in the High Seas arms trafficking case. The Attorney General filed the case under a series of charges including the illegal possession of 816 automatic firearms and 202,395 live bullets aboard the MV Avant Garde without any legal document. Earlier, the Attorney General filed an indictment containing 7,573 counts against 13 defendants, including Avant Garde Maritime Services Chairman Nisanka Senadipati. After considering the objections on the 17th of January 2020, the Permanent High Court Trial at Bar said of the 7,573 counts filed against the accused, only 19 can be carried forward in the case. The case was heard over the course of five years. Also, I must say that billions of dollars that was due to come into the country was lost because of MPs like Champika, Rajita, Anrukumara and Arjuna. 25,000 soldiers lost their jobs. The Honourable Learned Three-Member Bench delivered this decision. I would like to question Rajda, Arjuna, Champika and Anrukumara if they are happy that they derived the country of billions of dollars and that 25,000 soldiers lost their jobs. Rakyawal, Visipandak, Ranaviruvangi, Natikarupikana Santosadakir. 
Views were expressed today over the fact that the government did not secure a two-thirds majority for the passage of the Port City Economic Commission Bill yesterday. 149 votes were cast in favour of the bill, but now we realise that there was an error here. The vote cast by the Honourable Minister of Justice has not been counted. It also seems as if another vote cast by one of our MPs, Jairat Naherat, has not been counted. We are not trying to say that this was done intentionally. It seems as if the votes were not counted because of some small error that occurred in the parliamentary chambers yesterday. I got a telephone call from the Prime Minister as I came here. It was about how a technical error had occurred during the passage of the bill. The vote on the first reading of the bill being displayed as 148 was wrong. We got 150 votes, which is a two-third majority. During the third reading of the bill, I was the one who stood up and left, as I had an urgent matter to attend to. So it became 149. So this number being displayed as 148 or 147 was wrong. We got a two-third majority in Parliament for the Port City Bill yesterday. I would like to state that there was a miscalculation as two votes were not counted. We passed this bill yesterday with a two-thirds majority. We consider the failure to present the true mandate of the people in Parliament during the passage of this bill in Parliament as a serious lapse. We hope to look into how something like this took place. We requested the Speaker to launch a special investigation into this as though we have the support of a two-thirds majority. We were unable to show that in Parliament. When inquired on the incident, Speaker of Parliament Mahinda Yapa Abhivadadana said that if any party makes a request to recount the vote, it can be taken. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka Purujana Permana Parliamentarian Professor Tissa Vitarana has said that he was prevented from tabling an amendment to the bill. I was about to table an amendment. There was a shortcoming that I saw in the bill. Companies in the port city have been allowed to establish branches in the country. It is expected that these branches will be subjected to the regulations applied in the port city. There are laws that have been passed in the country to protect the rights and privileges of workers. My amendment clearly mentions that this assurance given to the rights and privileges of employees in the country must be given to employees at the port city. However, I was asked not to put forward that amendment. I was asked by my superiors to refrain from tabling the amendment. Therefore, I did not table that amendment. Meanwhile, eight amendments proposed to the bill by the Samagijana Balavege MP Harsha De Silva were rejected by the government, out of which three were defeated through a vote. The amendments defeated during a vote included the ex officio appointment of nine members to the commission, establishing the commission as a state corporation and the introduction of laws to regulate businesses in the port city. Parliament or the Maya Pay Anduko Vasa Yatape, Sampurna, Mahajana, Mudal Paripalina, Pilion, the Baleti, and America. It is the Parliament which has powers relating to public finance under our constitution and not any other entity that has not been changed under this Act. These tax concessions are being granted after receiving parliamentary approval. The Prevention of Terrorism Act and the Financial Transaction Reporting Act will be implemented in the port city. Therefore, the army, the police, and everyone else can visit the area. It is a myth to say that the area would function as a separate country. The judiciary in the country has the jurisdiction on matters concerning the port city. If anything wrong had taken place, a writ petition can be obtained from the appeal court under section 140 of the constitution. A human rights case can be filed at the Supreme Court as well. There are regulations for these purposes. It is clear that this is a part of our country. The country's courts can intervene if there is a need for arbitration in terms of commercial transactions. That is not an issue. We hope to construct a hospital complex in that area. We also aim at bringing international schools which are up to international standards as well. A theme park will be constructed. The country has already received 1.5 billion for this. By 2040, 15 billion US dollars would have been invested just for infrastructure facilities. We will receive investments as well.
We know that investing in this area will create avenues to reach out to half of the world's population. Investors will be drawn to this area once they know about this. We will introduce a single window investment facilitator here. This will generate a demand for graduates with IT degrees. Generally speaking, graduates of the Morotoy University will be able to find jobs soon after they graduate. That will be the situation created here. We report, you decide. We report, you decide. Ministers and MPs in the parliament cannot boast about patriotism. There were some who were against the MCC deal and who were willing to carry out hunger strikes. But they voted in favour of this treacherous bill without any hesitation. This is clearly a betrayal of the country. All these people will go down in history as traitors. The truth is, this is not what the government had in mind. The government is selling the country while the people are being denied. Today, there is no country to protect the people. Their intentions are to sell the country. The public opinion of the country losing its rights was not portrayed since there are restrictions in the country. We saw how the people use social media to urge their parliamentary representatives to vote against this bill. However, we saw how the parliamentarians voted in favour of the bill. We are suspicious as to whether these votes were influenced by China. This was done in a rush. The government wanted to pass this bill in order to please China. They were able to do that. They did that by disregarding the people's opinion. We remind you to observe whether your representatives voted for this destructive bill. Yesterday, News First reported on how parliamentarians had voted on the Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill. Tonight's report highlights how parliamentarians from the northwestern and central provinces had voted for this piece of legislation. Northwestern Province, Kurunagala District. MPs who voted in favour of the bill. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa, Johnston Fernando, Dayasiri Jayasekara, Shanta Bandara, Anurupriya Darshan Ayapa, Asanka Navaratna, Jayaratna Herat, D.B. Herat, Gunapala Ratna Sekara, Sumit Udukumbura, Saman Priya Herat. MPs who voted against the bill. Ashoka Be Singha, J.C. Alavatuwala, Tushara Indunil, Nalin Bandara Jayama. From the Putlam district, MPs who voted in favour for the bill are Arundika Fernando, Ashoka Priyanta, Chintaka Maya Dunne, Priyankara Jayaratna, Sanat Nishanta and Ali Sabri Rahim from the Muslim National Alliance. The MPs who voted against the bill are Niroshan Pereira and Hector Apuhami. Central Province, the Kandy District. MPs who voted in favour of the bill. Mahindananda Aludgamage, Kehelia Rambukwella, Dilum Amunugama, Luhan Ratwatta, Vasanthiyapa Bandara, Anuradha Jayaratna, Udayan Kirindigoda, Gunatilaka Raja Paksa. MPs who voted against the bill. Lakshman Kiriella, Abdul Halim, Velu Kumar. MP Rauf Hakim was not present during the vote. In the Nuadelia district, MPs who voted in favour of the bill include Jeevan Tondaman, Nimal Piyathissa, C.B. Ratnayaka and S.B. Disanayaka. MPs who voted against the bill are M. Udaya Kumar and V. Radhakrishnan. MP Palani Digambaran, who is on a three-month holiday, was not present during the vote. MP Marudapande Rameshwaran, who tested positive for COVID-19, was also absent. In the Mathale district, MPs who voted in favour of the bill are Janaka Bandara Tennakon, Premita Bandara Tennakon, Rohan Disanayaka and Nalaka Bandara Kotegoda. Rohini Kumari Vijay Ratna voted against the bill in the Mathale district. We report, you decide. The people have not gotten their fertilizer or urea. We toil here day and night. 
People who do not speak a word about us are speaking gibberish in parliament and trying to hand over this plot of land to the Chinese. MPs from Ampara are also voting in favour of this. They think you can't develop this country with agriculture. According to them, the farmers are useless. Farming is useless. You can't do anything with agriculture. According to them, the only way that Sri Lanka can develop is to pay back its loans and prosper through the port city. So these are very weird people. They are weird leaders. They were elected to develop agriculture in the country, but today farmers do not have fertilizer. These people are taking swift action to give away the port city to foreigners. They have visited this area on more than 10 occasions. They take away 10 or 12 bags of fertilizer. They return within a couple of days. Fertilizer is not available in the market as well. That is the true situation. The only way to develop this country is through the port city and not any other resource. Now they are focusing on the port city and they have forgotten about the farmers. They can carry out farming on the port city, pay off the debt and try to develop the country. We shall remain ostracized in the country. Farmers of Ampar gathered outside the Namal Talav Agrarian Services office today with the hopes of receiving fertilizer. These farmers have not received fertilizer for thousands of acres of land on which they have carried out cultivation. These farmers who work tirelessly day and night with the pure intention of feeding the nation have been left hopeless. <laughs> We did not apply fertilizer to our crops for a month now. When we visit the storage multiple times to obtain fertilizer, they always postpone the distribution of fertilizer. This is unfair. We have been waiting opposite the agrarian services office. Our time is wasted. Although we wait for hours, they won't help us. They are all focused on the port city. This is our situation. A group of these farmers were provided with fertilizer this evening. However, another group is yet to receive fertilizer. Do your online shopping with Sambole.lk. Home delivery and pickup now available. Sambole.lk. Screen local news. The Sri Lanka Navy said that the fire that erupted on the container ship Express Pearl has been controlled to a great extent. Person of Sri Lanka Navy Captain Indika De Silva said a yellow smoke was observed around 11:30 a.m. yesterday from one area of the vessel, and it was determined the smoke was the result of a chemical reaction between chemicals aboard the vessel and rainwater. A fire broke out aboard the vessel around 11:30 p.m., and the Sri Lanka Navy dispatched two offshore patrol vessels, Sri Lanka Naval Ship Sagara, Sri Lanka Naval Ship Sindurala, and a fast attack craft to control the fire. The container ship was in Anchorage about 9.5 nautical miles northwest of Colombo Port as the incident was reported. The distressed container ship has been manned by a crew of 25 who are Philippine, Chinese, Indian and Russian nationals. According to spokesperson of the Sri Lanka Navy Captain Indika De Silva, the vessel, which is registered under the flag of Singapore, had carried 1,486 containers with 25 tons of nitric acid, several other chemicals and cosmetics from the port of Hazira, India on 15th of May 2021. Meanwhile, the Minister of Ports and Shipping, Rohit Abe Gunawardana, arrived at the location early this morning to inspect the efforts undertaken by the Sri Lanka Navy to control the fire. Moreover, spokesperson of the Sri Lanka Navy, Captain Indika De Silva said, a special team comprising Sri Lanka Navy and Sri Lanka Ports Authority personnel got on board the ship and inspected the situation on board the ship where they suspected that the fire was erupted due to a reaction of the chemicals being transported on the vessel. Details pertaining to a large-scale sand racketeers taking place near Maduroya have surfaced at present. A sand racket has been ongoing for nearly seven months in the Madhuroya in Valikanda in Batikolo. Large kumuk trees in the banks of Madhuroya were cut down because of the racket.
ఇప్పుడు మీ అంటే కథాకారులు ఈ కథాకర్తలు కలిసి లైసెన్స్కి గంట సమయాన్ని ఈ కథ మేము తినాకమా మీ మటం వంకడ పాట అది తినా మమ్మల్ని కథలు తిన్నా కథలు తిన్నా మనం తాక తింటాం మీ ఒక్కగే మేము మేము వంకడలు అయితే కారణం దేశాల తిన్న అతను బాగా సీఎంలా తినాలా మన రంజు మీద బలానికి సార్ అవి దాన్నే మీకాం మిత్ర మంకడ కియ తినాలి యాడ్డకి అవసర కౌరారి వెళ్ళ మే లోడ్ కియ పట్టరా ఎలియట్ దానికి బాధనకర్ల బాగా ఎదో సార్ అడితే మిత్ర ముఖ తత్తి The police raided the area yesterday. Five suspects and five tractors were taken into police custody. The suspects were released on bail after being produced before court. Minister of Justice Ali Sabri has mooted a bill to increase the fine imposed for committing an act of torture. The bill mooted by Justice Minister Ali Sabri proposes to increase the fine for violating the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment Act. The term torture refers to physical or mental harm inflicted by a public official for obtaining information, a confession and also intimidating and coercing a person. Currently, offenders of this law convicted by the High Court can be sentenced to imprisonment between 7 to 10 years and a fine between 10,000 and 50,000 rupees. The latest bill proposes to increase this fine to between 50,000 and 200,000 rupees. Meanwhile, State Minister Jeevan Thondaman has also emphasized the need for new laws against the cruelty of animals. He made these remarks after social media was abuzz over the images of a dog that had been attacked brutally recently. I believe that there was an altercation between two individuals and out of which one individual had assaulted the other individual and not only did he assault the other individual, he also inhumanly attacked an animal and this may seem like a small issue to everyone but the pictures that I saw had uh, extremely graphic content. Legs of the dog were chopped off and the head was split into two. All this done by an individual. This sort of barbaric, barbaric activity, I feel, needs to be changed. We are still governed by an archaic law which you know, was developed in 1907, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And I feel the Animal Welfare Bill should be looked at right after all this. Under the Cruelty to Animals Act, the fine for ill-treating an animal stands at 100 rupees and or an imprisonment term of up to three months. Meanwhile, Minister Namal Rajapaksa said in Parliament that modern transaction modes including cryptocurrency will be brought to the Colombo port city in the future. The Economic Commission bill was passed in Parliament yesterday. Speaking during the debate on the bill, Minister Namal Rajapaksa said that Sri Lanka plans to allow cryptocurrency in the Colombo port city. <laughs> There are new forms of currency in the world such as cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. We will bring the latest form of currency to the port city. This will allow the future generation to reap the benefits of the port city with ease. The minister's remarks came a day after China launched a crackdown on the use of cryptocurrencies by banks. The Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill that was adopted yesterday does not outline any clause pertaining to the use of digital currency as well. A cryptocurrency is a type of money that is completely virtual and can be used to buy products and services. These digital currencies are basically computer files stored in a digital wallet app on a smartphone or computer. Popular cryptocurrencies include Bitcoin and Ethereum. Online data indicate that a Bitcoin is currently trading at 7.8 million Sri Lankan rupees. Last month, the central bank cautioned the public on the risks of investing in virtual currencies in Sri Lanka. The Monetary Authority pointed out that there are no regulatory safeguards to the usage of cryptocurrency and that it is likely to be associated in financing terrorist activities and money laundering. According to the central bank, virtual currencies are not a permitted investment category under the Foreign Exchange Act. Just before we wrap up this evening, taking a look at some news from China, a 6.1 magnitude earthquake struck the southwestern Chinese province of Yunnan, 
According to the United States Geological Survey, the quake hit a short while ago with its epicenter near the city of Dali, a popular tourist destination at a depth of 10 kilometers. It was initially recorded as a 6.0 magnitude quake before USGS revised its size upwards. There were no immediate reports of casualties or major damage. With that, we wrap up this edition of Primetime News for today. I'm Tarush Kumar Singh along with our sign language interpreter for today, Tarka Gabriel. Good night.